and agriculture in Canada. So we welcome persons from across the region, from the Caribbean countries, as well as a few countries in Latin America. This morning's information session is entitled New Requirements Under the Safe Food for Canadian Regulations. Aika has been serving countries of the Americas for over 76 years in areas ranging from rural development to food safety. Our members in the 34 countries of the Americas have similar interests as well as very different priorities. However, part of ICA's success is our ability to keep our finger on the pulse, addressing the needs and opportunities through technical cooperation activities with public and private sector, academia, and civil society. In this way, we are able to continue being both responsive and relevant. Agricultural health, food safety, and food quality is one of the five main program areas in ICAS 2018 to 2022 medium term plan. Like you, we believe that these areas are central to making our agri-food systems safer, more productive and sustainable, and of course, more competitive in local and export markets. Understanding the relevant standards and regulations governing agri-food products is a prerequisite to compliance. For AICA Canada, Sharing information, knowledge, and innovations is really in our DNA. It's integral to what we do. Your Excellency is here in, in Ottawa, joining us this morning in the, in the room of, uh, in the office of ETA Canada. Producers joining us from across the region, manufacturers, regulators, inspectors, friends all. ICA is here to help to prepare our member states understand the implications and comply with the new Safe Food for Canadians regulations. Some of you may even recall that, the, that around four or five years ago, ICA Canada had facilitated a similar session when the act was passed. This morning, we are very, very pleased that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, in the person of Danielle Boudron, will be providing pertinent information for persons planning to export Canada. So therefore, friends, on behalf of AICA, our country representatives and technical specialists from across Latin America and the Caribbean, all our member countries. We welcome you to this webinar and encourage you to take full advantage of having the expert here to field your questions. Welcome again, and I trust we'll have a productive session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Barnett, and uh, welcome everyone to our session. Uh, welcome to the people here in the, in the room and all the participants. We have many, many people online. Uh, without further delay, I think we will just uh, go into the presentation and uh, I uh, will uh, stop at, uh, in a half an hour, or approximately, and uh, take on questions from everyone. Until then, uh, your microphones will be muted. We need to get a um, speaker. Not the volume doesn't seem very loud. You can hear it? A little, yeah, it sounds a little bit. Is the TV as well as your computer? Hold on, let me see. 
Normally we control the volume. Yeah, the volume. Okay. I'll speak up a little bit. Are you sharing the screen? Let me check on something. See how best to make this one up. See a second. Let me see. She wants to meet. Mm -hmm. If you could mute your microphones uh, where you are, that would be helpful because we are hearing a lot of uh, background noise. Thank you very much. So without further delay, um, this, um, this is the just the uh, first uh, slide which shows, which shows a variety of food products. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today, we'll touch up upon all types of food, uh, meat, fish, and fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, processed products, uh, honey, maple for Canada, um, and uh, all sorts of other products. Uh, the objective of the presentation today is to give you an, an overview of the current Canadian import framework, an overview of the Safe Food for Canadians regulations, the key provisions, the implications for foreign exporters and Canadian importers, and details on various resources available to you uh, to uh, research more on the topic. These slides will be shared with you or with the IEK offices and will be available to you. So you don't have to take the notes of everything that the presentation will be available to you after. So I'm talking about before and, and before was before January of this year, we had still a solid foundation for our regulations, but we had quite a number of different acts and regulations, 14 regulations in total. Uh, that were um, that were uh, under the CFI for that they were prescriptive and they were complex. Whereas today we have what we think is a more robust regulatory system. One regulation for all food commodities. Um, we are focusing on prevention. We are looking at outcomes instead of preventive, and we think that it is. Just to start with, I just want to put um, from our point of view, the food regulatory landscape since January 2019 of this year uh, is the Food and Drug Act and the Food Drug Regulations in Canada still apply for some of the uh, standards, some of the, ma the maximum limits and the list of additives and the requirements for food. Uh, also, now we have the new Safe Food for Canadian Act and Regulations in orange. Um, while the, acts, the Health of Animals Act and Regulations and the Plant Protection Act and Regulations do still uh, apply. I don't know what to do. I... We had some one time. I didn't maybe on the laptop. Uh, approved. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what we have to stop it in order to mute. I'm getting the trying to get the audio off. So she's trying to get the audio off. Mute on. The blue, the blue made food safe. I'm gonna know if it's if it's if but then, but then you can 
you're because you're allowing that to unmute themselves. That's why I'm not mm -hmm. You're not on YouTube. Mm -hmm. No, it seems to be working now. It's working now. It's working. It's working. All right. So we're back. Rebecca. So we we from this from this uh, this station here, this computer, we've muted the other lines uh, to try to to help with the facilitate with the, the sound. Thank you for your patience. I might go back one slide just to to. All right. So I was talking about the fact that there are not only the Safe Food for Canadian Act and regulations, but uh, the, the Health of Animals Act and regulations and the Plant Protection Act and regulations still do apply in case uh, to prevent uh, uh, incursion of pests and diseases in animals. Uh, this, in this slides, I'm, what I'm showing is the roles and responsibilities. And starting at the bottom of the slide, you, what you have is the vendor or exporter uh, and foreign supplier that uh, chooses to to ship the product and we see a container ship um, and this arrives in Canada. We have the, the dotted line is the clean border. The first point where the products are inspected is by the Canada Border Services Agency. And what they look for is that uh, the paperwork is in order and all of the, uh, they review all the paperwork and make sure that there is no contraband uh, in the goods and their objective is to prevent contraband and to ensure that what is declared is what is actually imported. After that, the CFIA, where I work, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, may conduct some inspection of the, of the goods, depending on um, a uh, pre-established sampling plan. Uh, a percentage of the food will be inspected. Not everything gets inspected. We work on a risk basis, so we inspect the, the riskiest foods first. And we see the role of the importer and the broker um, as a new responsibility. The importer and the broker will have more responsibilities under the new regs to ensure that the food that is imported meets Canadian requirements. Okay. Just to run through quickly the generic import process. It's important to understand the requirements, number one. Um, so uh, if you understand the requirements, you may have to ask a permission. A permission is a permit for animal health or uh, plant health that is uh, needed. Uh, the importer will need an import license. Then the clearance is what happens with the Canada Border Services Agency at the border. Um, the inspection at this nation is performed by CFIA at number five. And then we issue a report to the importer about uh, the conclusion of the inspection. I've listed here, and I repeat, this document will be available to you. I've listed here some of the tools that are uh, used to better understand the import process into Canada. One of them is the automated import reference system, computer software, uh, and that computer software gives all the requirements for the um, for the food and the different uh, commodities. Uh, we have some guidance documents that are published freely available on our website. There's a step-by-step -step guide to importing food and a guide for preparing a preventive control plan for importers. So we provide those examples, those models to help uh, importers uh, so they don't have to build their own control plan. Now I uh, the Canada Border Services Agency also provides a guidance document for how to uh, proceed the process of importing commercial goods into Canada. What is the actual process? And I've mentioned uh, documents by Health Canada for the maximum residue limits for pesticides and veterinary drug residues. And plus Health Canada publishes the list of permitted additives that goes into food. So what is, it, what is it that this new act and regulations have to do with trade with Canada? So the, the foods to be exported to Canada need to meet Canadian standards as before. The Canadian exports depend on the strength of the domestic food safety system, starting with the regulatory framework. So here we're talking about what happens domestically. The new regulations allow for continued equivalence with the US uh, Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011 
and as well as uh, other trading partners. And the new Safe Food for Canadian regulations is aligned with codex principles, and this will facilitate market access and equivalence with other countries that have modernized their regulatory framework. The Act provides legal authority for the CFIA, where I work, to issue export certificates for any food. The licensing of exporters provides greater assurance that food coming from Canada will be safe. Uh, the outcome-based preventive control provisions enable industry to implement validated controls required by their export markets without having to put in place different measures for Canada. And this creates a level playing field for domestic producers who have been subject to Canadian requirements um, that may not have applied to imported food in the past. I'll spend a bit of time on this slide because if there's one of the key messages of the presentation this morning is to understand the three pillars that form the Safe Food for Canadian Act and regulations. Uh, the first pillar is licensing that allows us to identify who are the regulated parties? Who will be importing food in Canada? Please note that foreign businesses and foreign exporters do not need to hold a license to export to Canada. So that is very important. The licensing applies to the domestic plants in Canada and to the importers only. The second pillar is preventive controls. Under preventive controls, we have a great number of different things that are called in different countries, but mostly they're known as HACCP or HACCP plans. And what it consists of is documentation of hazards and measures to address what hazards are in food and how to control them. And the last pillar is traceability. The requirement for traceability is across the whole chain of supply of food. And it is keeping track of who the person bought the food from and who they sold it to. And this needs to be kept, these records need to, to be kept for two years and need to be available upon request to CFI. Some of the license requirements. So if a person, a person also includes a business, if a person is doing any of the following activities in Canada, they would require a license. So if they are manufacturing, processing, treating, preserving, grading, packaging, labeling a food that will be exported or moved between Canadian provinces, they will need a license. The second bullet says importing a food. So importers in Canada need a license to import food. And then the Canadian exporters need a license to export food that requires a certificate from CFI. And then any of the slaughtering plants in Canada need a license and uh, anybody storing and handling a meat product in its imported condition needs a license. What will the licensing allow CFI to do? The licensing will allow CFI to identify businesses preparing food for interprovincial trade or export and importers importing food into Canada. The license will authorize the person to carry out the specified activities that have been named above. Those manufacturing, processing, treating, all these verbs are referred to activity. The preventive controls that we are requiring and the second uh, pillar, they will be outcome-based. Outcome-based means that we will provide for flexibility and innovation where possible. And instead of being prescriptive, they say what is the, out the objective. So the objective is to have safe food, to have food that does not contain uh, pesticide residues or residues of veterinary drugs. Uh, it's a food that uh, will be safe for the consumer. So that's what the objective is. And the outcome is, so we, we're not saying how to achieve it necessarily, but those preventive controls will cover the treatment and the processes of manufacturing, the conditions in the establishment that produce the food, the level of sanitation applied, and things like pest control plans and competency of the staff in the manufacturing plant. All these preventive controls can be grouped into a plan, a written plan, that will document 
all potential hazards associated with the food and will show how they will be controlled, which is a principle that is consistent with HACCP. It's not always required. However, the preventive control requirements must be met irrespective of whether or not the preventive control plan is required. So the plan, depending on the size of the businesses, they don't necessarily need to have like the big written plan, but they need to still have preventive controls. That's what the last bullet wants to say. The, the last uh, of those three pillars is a traceability. So anyone who has a license to prepare food for interprovincial trade or imports or exports is required to maintain records to identify the food and trace the food. One step forward and one step back. This is the codex principle of traceability. And so one step forward is who this food is sold to, and one step back is who you bought the food from or the ingredients. Retailers in Canada, such as grocery stores, bakeries, and butcheries are responsible for tracing food one step back only to their suppliers. So they don't need to keep the tracing to the consumer. Um, traceability requirements in Canada do not apply to restaurants or other similar businesses. So what are the import requirements under the regulations? The importers in Canada will have to have a license to import. They will have to have a preventive control plan uh, unless exempt. And those exemptions are mostly for very small businesses. So very small businesses are exempt from having um, a written preventive control plan. Uh, importers need to ensure that their foreign suppliers you, the people that I'm talking to this morning, are manufacturing, preparing, storing, packaging, and labeling the food under the same conditions as provided by the regulations. And we name the sections of the regulations where those conditions are, sections 47 to 81. But in other words, the food that you prepare must be prepared in a safe manner. And importers need to investigate potential health risk and non-compliances. And they need to maintain a procedure and processes for handling complaints from, from buyers in Canada and consumers and recalls that might be uh, needed if there is a food safety incident. In case of a food safety incident, the importer would be responsible to know who they sold their food to and contact them for recalling it. The importers will also need to keep clear and complete traceability records that show who the food was obtained from and to whom it was sent. This is another key slide that I want to show you. Three things that importers need to know in Canada, which impact you, the suppliers. So the importer know, needs to know the foreign supplier. The importer needs to know who you are, needs to have details of how you're implementing good manufacturing practices and has the principles. The Canadian regulations does not require that the Canadian importer go visit you, does not require a visit to your plant, but they should have in their possession information related to how you are implementing good manufacturing practices. The importer should know the food, and by that we mean like what are the hazards associated with the food? Because the regulations cover all the types of foods, Hazards vary between fish, meat, candies, dry goods, rice, and so on and so forth, do not have the same hazards, but the importer needs to understand what those hazards are. And for the great majority of them, importers need to have a plan. So do they need to have preventive control plan uh, for the steps that they've taken to ensure that the food is safe and meets Canadian requirements. So that's another one of those important slides. Um, in terms of the import process, I want to reassure people that a lot of what was, what the process was before January 2019 is still the same today. Um, other than the Safe Food for Canadian Import License number, the information provided with each shipment will remain consistent with what was currently provided before. There's a typo there in that slide, it should have said with what was currently provided. Uh, importers, brokers should continue to consult 
the automated import reference system that is online on, on the computer to determine the import requirements. The uh, errors will indicate whether an import license is required for a particular food. And CFI will continue to work in partnership with the Canada Border Services Agency at the border to verify that food entering Canada meets Canadian requirements. And we have in Canada a National Import Service Centre that is open seven days a week and covers 20 hours per day to help importers and exporters facilitate their process of submitting their documentation for review. And so we cover seven days a week, 20 hours per day, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to 2 a.m. the next day. Um, under this, this SFCR, uh, imported meat products, I'm, I'm just going to cover a little bit. Imported meat products, um, most of the meat products, we maintain the requirements that uh, meat must come from approved meat inspection system and approved establishments. In this case, the CFIA does visit foreign countries and visit the meat establishments uh, for approval and reviews the inspection system in the foreign country. So this is still the, the case for, for meat. Um, and for fish and seafood, the importers must meet the same preventive control plans, of food safety requirements as any other foods and all importers now have to do this. We have a bit of a, a special case for live and raw molluscan shellfish. Those are clams and oysters um, mostly and CFIA, uh, CFIA will maintain requirements that those raw shellfish come from approved inspection systems and approved establishments. So in this case, CFIA will also go visit the foreign country to approve that harvest system in the establishments. Um, and uh, that we will maintain on the CFI website the list of who's approved for raw milk and shellfish and the list of who's, which meat establishments uh, in foreign countries are approved as well. Um, the impact on you, the foreign exporters. So your Canadian importer may ask information about the products you are exporting, you, the, the documentation that you have, your good manufacturing practices. They uh, might ask you how you're addressing hazards associated with the food. They may ask you if you are part of a food safety certification system or program. A lot of people have heard of GFSI, and that is a program that a lot of buyers in Canada are adhering to and requiring foreign suppliers to adhere to as well. It's not the only food safety certification program, but it will help you if you have implemented one of those certification programs in your plant. And the uh, Canadian importer might visit you to verify the, effective, the effectiveness of your control. This is not a requirement under the law and regulation that they must visit you, but they might want to visit you uh, so that they understand a little bit more your business. Sorry, what's the certification program? So it's GFSI, it's Global Food Safety Initiative. Global Food Safety Initiative is one of the programs. Yeah. Uh, this table here, um, what's important is on the yellow column on the left hand side, is that uh, starting January 2019, we are applying the requirements of the reg regulations to a set of commodities and not all commodities at the same time. So what we have is a slow transition. This year in January, we have meat, eggs, fish, uh, processed products, um, and, and uh, all of the uh, uh, fruits and vegetables need to have a license. So that in the yellow column, they need to have a license, they need to apply. For those importers importing fresh fruits and vegetables, they have until next year to have their preventive control plan. And all of the foods will have until July 15, 2020 to have their preventive control plan. So the regulations don't apply to them yet. So there's a graduated approach. 
And it's a little bit complicated on the right hand side of the table because we are showing that very small businesses, those that sell for less than $100,000 and have uh, less or more than, than four employees, there's a difference as to when they have, until when they have to have their preventive control plan. So the ultimately, the very small businesses in Canada uh, have until 2021 to, to uh, adopt all these measures. Uh, please visit the website www.inspection.gc.ca backslash or slash safe food. We have a lot of information. We have 12 key portals there to explain the requirements. And there's a ton of information. There are model PCP, preventive control plans for importers and exporters. We have also uh, some of the, um, I'll, I'll just show a little bit later. We have videos on YouTube. Uh, we have infographics that are explained the requirements visually with, with uh, drawings. Um, and we do have uh, a place that people can call to or email if they have questions. Um, so that, if you want to stay up to date, uh, you, can, you can follow the CFIA on Twitter. You can look at our YouTube videos. Um, you can also subscribe to listservs and get information uh, about what is new. And that is my presentation. And then we'll, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, open, we'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. Um, and uh, I'll, keep, I'll ask Odia to, to uh, unmute all of the uh, different participants. And we have lots of people, one at a time. <laughs> OK, thank you so much, Daniel. That was certainly a very clear and informative presentation. Okay. We, we're still gonna have you on mute. If you have a question, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to ask you to um, indicate by raising your hand. I think there should be a hand on the, at the bottom. Um, just indicate that you, that you wish to speak. I know that some of our offices, we have several um, uh, of our, our uh, partners or manufacturers and regulators in the room. So please just introduce yourself when you're going to be addressing a question. Uh, and I see that we have some persons right from the factory floor or from the, the businesses themselves. Uh, welcome all and please, use the opportunity to, to, to ask your questions, share your, uh, your concerns, but be very, very succinct in your, in your intervention. Uh, afterwards, if we are not able to take all the questions, um, uh, Daniel will be more than happy to, 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 to send you uh, a response to, to the ones we haven't taken. So I will unmute when I see an indication, I'm not seeing any indications yet but we have a couple questions that daniel probably could start with yes so some of the questions that we received already were um, um what documentation importers need from manufacturers based on the new legislation and i covered that in the presentation um it's mostly it is more, mostly the preventive controls that you have in place and the, what you're following in terms of good manufacturing practices also, I mentioned that certification program, if you are part of a certification program, that will be useful for the importer to have. Uh, we have a question that asks, what is the difference between the US requirements and the Canadian requirements? So the US requirements under the Food Safety uh, Modernization Act and the Canadian Safe Food for Canadian Act. The biggest difference is in Canada, this new act and regulation covers all the food. It covers meat, it covers fish, it covers fresh fruits and vegetables, and all of the other foods. It's important to understand the, the in the US, the Food and Drug Administration, FISMA, only covers those goods that are under the responsibility of, of the Food and Drug mm -hmm. Administration. Whereas in Canada, we have uh, put everything together in one single act, as we are one single agency that, um, 
uh, responsible for that. So that's that's a good question. And the biggest difference is that uh, we cover all of the types of products. Um, there was a question about uh, is if I will be conducting inspections of food uh, food processing facilities. Yes, we will. We will conduct inspection of foreign meat establishments and meat and meat products, abattoirs and, and, and so on. And we will also conducting inspections for those harvest sites and establishments that handle raw and live mollusk and shellfish. Apart from that, CFIA uh, may visit a, a country to visit establishments if we are aware of recurrent problems. We do have a team that goes, that visits other countries to visit them and uh, conduct inspections where we have noticed uh, some serious uh, problems and uh, we go verify on the spot what is happening there. Uh, but that is a very small team and, and we cannot cover everybody at the same time. Another question that was asked before the presentation was, is there's prescribed guidelines for processors to use to meet the safe food for cleaning requirements? So the prescribed guidelines are mostly in Health Canada's uh, guidelines, the list of pesticides that are approved and their maximum residue limits, the approved veterinary drugs and therapeutics, and the list of permitted additives. So that's, that's one of the things I want to cover is that, that those may be different in Canada than in other countries. And we have published a food manual to help, uh, to help the companies, the processors, understand the requirements. So please consult the food manual that is on the CFI website and it is free for you to download. Um, one of the one of the other question is: Is there emphasis for prevention in the supply chain? Well, yes, actually, that is very important because that is the focus of the regs: is to have prevention of problems throughout the supply chain, and so from from the farm to from the gate to the plate, or from the farm to the fork, depending on what you want to use as a metaphor. Um, and uh, that, that uh, covers some of the um, questions that I had. Okay, okay. So, so in the room, I must mention that we have um, head of mission from several countries and, 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 and as well as representatives. We have Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, Jamaica, Barbados, and Costa Rica, and we, we welcome them. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the room here while you get ready with your questions online. I'm still not seeing your hands and I'm not sure why. I know you have questions, but um, I think we have a question now from Guatemala, then followed by Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. First of all, to, to Inika to organize this and talk to you. It's important for uh, this event to explain as all the new regulations. Well, I have a question about traceability. Uh, in the case of Guatemala, we have the, the case of uh, some American brokers buying from Guatemala and selling to, to Canada. Uh, that's, uh, how does it, does it work? Uh, because that's a very important part of our, our exports to indirectly to, to Canada. It, it is around, uh, 30% more or less uh, of our exports to Canada goes through the, the brokers of the United States. So traceability, how is, does it work in that, in that case? We want to avoid that. We, our, our aim is to export directly, but in the meantime, it's, it's happening. Thank you very much for the question, uh, traceability. Because traceability is so important to be able to address food safety issues, uh, recalls, or if, if there is a food safety outbreak, foodborne outbreak, 
we are requiring that if those uh, producers in Guatemala sell to the American brokers, that the American brokers are able to provide this traceability as to uh, product lot codes, for instance, or any other unique identifier that is associated with those lots need to be given to the Canadian importer. So that traceability will, will, will work in terms of if the goods have some kind of coding, some date of production, uh, place of harvest, we, we call unique identifier. A unique identifier is, we're not saying exactly what it should look like. It can be a lot code, but many times fresh produce does not have lot codes, but they know where the farm of harvest is or who got it, who um, it processed it in Guatemala and then shipped it. So those kind of information needs to travel with the goods along the chain to the importer in Canada. So that information will be very important to, to be passed on. Thank you. Uh, any questions from online? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, I can hear you. That means you're able to unmute. Oh, I'm seeing your hand now. Is that Alexis? This is Lisa. Lisa. Good morning. Good morning. Could you introduce yourself? And persons who are not speaking, please remember to mute your mic. Hi, this is Lisa Lucine. I have a question. Um, if I import materials from Canada, will I be able to tell if the company that I'm exporting from is licensed for export? Will there be a list posted so that I could see if this company is approved for export? For you as a buyer, you want to know. Yes, as a buyer. Yes, yes. So there is, there is a list currently of uh, license holders for export purposes. It's on the website. Um, it's also uh, accessible. The exporter needs to provide you the proof that uh, they are licensed and they are in good standing. So you can ask that from your supplier as to, to demonstrate to you and they will show you um, the proof that they are in fact licensed and uh, in good standing. Okay, thank you very much. That's You're welcome. Thanks. That was was that Lisa Marie. Yes. Okay. So Alexis. I think, okay. Thank you, Alexis. Hi. Good morning, everybody. I joined the presentation late, and the connection is not so good, so I may have missed this point. My facility is already SQS certified, and we were. We implemented the preventative controls for human food through the United States. I wanted to know, the only thing I picked up that was different was the licensing. Is there anything else that is a must have for me right now? Thank you, Alexis. This is a great question. Uh, you, you and your business do not have to have a license in order to export to Canada. And the fact that you are SQF certified and you already have those controls to meet the US requirements, uh, you are already in great shape to export to Canada. So the importer in Canada uh, would be uh, very happy to learn that you are SQF certified and you have all the controls already in place. Great, thank you. I think we have Mexico. Thank you so much. Uh, Yes. Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that a fru a processed food already has to have uh, or is already included in the new regulations starting January 15th. Uh, but does that apply to uh, small producers also? Because I know there's a difference between large and small producers. Do they also have to comply with that even if they have processed food but small? So, yes, thank you. Thank you, that's, that's I, I should have covered that in better detail because that's a very important, I'm sure a lot of people have the same question as you. When, when, it, it, um, when we're talking about the license requirement and that the small businesses have until 2021 
to comply. Those small importers that import less than $100,000 in Canada do not have to have their own preventive controls in place, but they must buy from a source that does. So the, source. the foreign supplier must have uh, preventive controls in place, but they themselves as a very, very small importer, they don't have, they have two more years in order to build their paperwork and, and their documentation. But when, who they buy from, the product must meet Canadian requirements. So this, this, uh, this time that we allow for small businesses to be compliant with the, the preventive control plans means that they have more time than the bigger businesses to get their documentation prepared. However, the food as of January 2019 must meet the requirements. All food or only the, 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 so, first, the, so, so the first column, the first column. The first column. So the first column and uh, those processed products, they, they, are, they have a special definition in Canada. These are canned goods, and jams in jars and so on and so forth. So these are the definition as per what is processed products in Canada. It's not all types of foods. Great, thank you. Laurie, Knight? Laurie, we're not hearing you. Let's let, hold on. I think you're still muted. Unmute. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. We're you now. Yes, go we ahead. can hear you. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. All right, so I'm a fine supplier of processed fruits and vegetables. And my question is during the presentation, it was mentioned that the HACCP or the GMP. Um, systems that the importer, I think it was, is required to have or documentation, but there was a time frame that was given and I wasn't, like, I didn't hear it clearly, the whole long they should have for. All right, thank you very much, Lori. So for fresh fruits and vegetables, the importers in Canada have until next year in order to have all their uh, preventive control plans uh, detailed and documented. And so this is this is this applies to the importer itself. Um, okay. you, you as the exporter, um, if you already have good manufacturing practices, good agricultural practices that are applied, um, the importer will ask you to provide those. So you might provide okay. those information to the importer. Okay, so if I have the SQF, the HACCP, and the GMP already in place, and I provide it to the importer, they're required to have it done yearly, like have the de documentation um, transferred to them annually. That's, that's correct. Yes, that's correct. They have one year. They have one year to 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 get that information from you. Okay. All right. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Okay, Jamaica in the room, and then I don't know if Jamaica speaker office has any questions. Uh, good morning, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a bit of a concern, which I appreciate the check on that one for small um, exporters. So, um, we find in the Caribbean region we have a lot of um, small farmers, and so they have to choose if they want to export. My concern is what are the additional requirements that will now be imposed based on the F, the SFCR regs in addition to the Plant Protection and Health, and Health Animals Act all being enforced at once. Um, will these additional requirements on these small exporters present some sort of a hindrance or a technical barrier to their ability to engage in Yes, that is a one of the fundamental questions that we get uh, over and over again is, is this new reg, 
creating a barrier, in fact, to exports from small producers in foreign countries. Um, so in Canada, before, we did not have those kind of controls. And we have worked for many, many years in trying to introduce those controls with our own farmers. Um, and it's difficult for everyone. It's difficult for the Canadian farmers to embark on those good agricultural practices and, and so on and so forth. Some of the, some of the commodities uh, don't all have to have the same type of controls. For fresh fruits and vegetables, we are looking at control of the irrigation water, uh, some of the uh, post-harvest uh, treatments, if uh, there is control about the quality of the water that is used to wash the fruits and vegetables and so on and so forth. You will find that those requirements that Canada is uh, adopting today have been adopted a long time ago by the EU, have been adopted uh, some time by the US, a little bit earlier than us. And now Canada is adopting them. Because we, we uh, think that, especially in, in fresh fruits and vegetables, there's a, quite a number of foodborne illnesses that are associated with that commodity. And we are trying to improve the safety of the food for the consumers. So is it difficult? It is a technical requirement. It is something that is additional to what used to be there um, that we are imposing on our own farmers as well. Um, so yes, it, it does have an impact. Okay, thank you. I see that Guyana, Ika Guyana has a question and um, we're going to just scroll down to read it in the school. And just to note that the presentation is on the website yeah. and we will also have it on our own website. It's on the CFIA website and we'll also host it on the Ika website. So the question? Can so the question from Aika Guyana is, what specific food safety certification programs and schemes would be accepted for fr fruits and vegetables export to Canada? Um, we, uh, CFI, are not going to dictate which ones are acceptable and which ones aren't acceptable. I've uh, named a few. We have this morning discussed the SQF, GF GFSI. In Canada, we have our own system, which is called Canada Good Agricultural Practices. Um, in the US, they have uh, some different ones. So we're, we don't want to prescribe which ones are the right ones, but um, those that are usually recognized certification programs and have an international nature, I think, would be accepted in general. Good. Thanks, Daniel. Are there any other questions? I'm not seeing. Could you just scroll down a bit? Okay, here's one. So here's one from, uh, from Jamaica. Well, okay. Yes. Canada has system recognition from USA. Is there a plan for Canada to recognize food safety systems of exporting countries? So uh, that's a great question from Jamaica. In um, right now, we only have one system, which is the USA. In the future, the regulations gives us the authority to negotiate with any other country for some kind of uh, recognition of food safety systems. Um, I must say that at this time, we are so busy implementing the regulations that we do not have uh, a plan to start assessing new countries yet. So this will come in the future. Uh, I see also Lisa Marie has uh, posted another question. Lisa Marie is asking, does the regulation cover food contact packaging? So in Canada, we do not regulate food contact packaging anymore. We used to, and uh, we don't. So it is the responsibility of the manufacturers of uh, packaging to provide you with their validation studies that the packaging is safe for food. 
So they must be able to demonstrate to you that their food packaging is meant to package food and has been tested and, and, and is correct. So CFIA does not regulate food contact packaging anymore. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you also for posting questions um, in the chat box. So if you, if you are having a problem with your mic, please remember you can use the chat box. We have another couple minutes. Any additional questions? Okay, we have another one from the High Commission of Jamaica. Um, this one is pretty simple. Um, it's in relation to cannabis edibles, um, whether or not the regulations um, make provisions for persons wishing to export to Canada. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm so happy with the quality of questions I'm getting because these are very, very good. <laughs> So CFIA does not regulate edibles for cannabis. It will be the Department of Health, Health Canada, that will in the future publish regulations specific to edibles. And this has yet to be done. Uh, so look for it in the future. Uh, but at this time, uh, cannabis edibles are not allowed yet. Great. Yes. Excellent. So you see, you think you have everything on the website, but there are still questions. There's still questions. <laughs> okay. Um, we have another question here. Um, will Canada be offering training for exporting countries to meet the requirements? So Canada, unlike the U.S., who, who requires that somebody be trained in the Food Safety and Modernization Act, we do not require that you have training for the Safe Food for Canadians Act and regulations. So we do not offer training per se. Uh, we do have some technical assistance sometimes that we provide. Um, we've done some in the past where we've uh, visited some countries, but specifically on the act and regulations, no, we don't offer uh, the training because it's not a requirement that uh, you be trained for the Canadian Act and regulations. And just as a PS to note that ECA in, in, in Canada, as well as in our member countries, we stand ready to assist in this knowledge sharing and training as, as, as yes. necessary. Yep. Um, and, and although we don't require training under the Act, training also always helps. I see Winston Stoner. Hi, Winston. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Colombia. This is just a simple question too. Um, probably I miss it, but um, uh, the importer has to have a license for each treatment or is has to be renewed no, on a regular no, basis? One license that is good for two years. Oh, for two years. It's a, like a driver's license. You can drive any car once you have your driver's license. So the importer has to have one license, which is renewable every two years. To import any type of food. Okay, it was in connection with with your question because for cannabis you have to have wine license for each shipment. Okay, yeah, yes, that's uh, really different. That's that's different for yeah. So we're it's not food. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <Kind of>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I the yes the session is being recorded and we can make the recording available through our ECO member countries throughout the hemisphere. So you can check with the ECO office if you need the recording. I think that question came from Lisa in Trinidad though. And so she's at the ECO office. So yes, we are recording it and we will share it afterwards. Uh, There's another question about a prescribed guideline for the new regulation. Yes, we have, we have published a lot of interpretive guidelines on our website. So all of this is being published on our website and we have a number of Q's and A's. We have guidelines for by type of food. We have guidelines especially related to manufacturing food, pasteurization, uh, curing, uh, making uh, canned goods. We have all of those guidelines which are free for you to consult on our website at the website that I saw. It's, inspection.gc.ca slash safe food. If you go there, there's a lot of information 
and all the gui guidelines are there. Thanks, Vania. We're just about out of time. Do we have any final questions? Can you repeat the website? <laughs> yes. So the website is on the presentation the box. It's on the press. Like maybe we can we can we can show it uh, again uh, the presentation just to share with everyone. Oh, it's on the presentation. That on the presentation that. The uh, so I'll just I'll just move. I just move to. I, I. Hold a second, Gloria. He's trying to move it from here. But uh, it's not. Uh, it's not working. Oh. Can you move? To, yeah. Can you move to the next pages? No, the previous one. You're going. You're going. Per, you're, going you're supposed to be going back. Yeah. yeah. No. 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 Go, go to the. Gloria, end. you're going backwards. We're going. We want to go forward. Yeah. There we Great. go. There it is. No, this is yes, this one. This is at the bottom there. Inspection.gc.ca safe food. Okay. And Audrey. Audrey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Winston. I thought you were going to be quiet. <laughs> Hi, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I must congratulate you. It's, it's, it's been a, a, a wonderful presentation. Um, one of the things that I wanted just to clarify, uh, there were a, a number of uh, questions coming from folks who were shipping through the U.S. and moving from the U.S. to Canada. Yes. Now, um, do I understand then that uh, formally, there was an understanding that you were not required to do bilingual labels um, for a certain time. Uh, we certainly know, having been shipping to Canada for a number of years, that we have to do bilingual labels. But I, I, I'm wondering if that still is in effect, that if you're putting in a new product, you're not really sure how it would perform in the marketplace. You don't have to go to the business of printing bilingual labels, but that you have a, a given time frame with which you can enter the market and test the market. Because I'm hearing people talking about sending into the shipping to the US and moving from the US to Canada. So can you clarify that for me? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for the question. That's a great question. We do allow test market or authorization for a product to be tested in the market, which does not have to have all of the labeling as per Canadian requirements, as per French and English. Um, this, this authorization is for prepackaged goods. So goods that are made in a country, already packaged for consumer ready uh, consumption, and they will be put in the grocery store or in the retail shelves in Canada. And there's those test market, um, they need to be requested. There, there's a request to have this permission to test. And there's usually a one year time period to test right. them before getting the labels uh, all sorted out. Fine. Fine, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all and thank you for the, the, the notes of um, appreciation and thanks. I want to, on your behalf, thank Daniel for the excellent presentation and the way that he was able to field all the questions that came to him. Remember, please, if you have additional questions, uh, the, the, the website has, um, the, the presentation indicated the, the email address you can send them to or you could send it to your eco offices that would um, coordinate with us here. We want to thank persons from the various embassies here in Ottawa who joined us here today. And um, we want to thank our representatives and technical uh, specialists from all the eco countries who coordinated with producers and manufacturers and regulators uh, to, 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 have, um, to have persons <coughs> Uh, address their questions and hear the presentation. Special thanks to Jamaica because the initial 
request came from manufacturers in Jamaica through the ECO office, and we want to thank you for initiating this, um, this session. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. The presentation will be on the CFIA's website as well as on ECA's website. Thank you so much. Good day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.